So good afternoon to this Upskill Works Forum where we bring you interviews with business and community leaders, policymakers, and leading thinkers on some of the key workforce issues confronting our region. I'm Peter Beard and I lead the Greater Houston Partnerships Upskill Houston Initiative that partners with employers, educational institutions, and community-based organizations to strengthen the region's talent pipeline uh, and to help Houstonians connect to good jobs that increase economic mobility and prosperity. And we're especially gonna need that as we recover from this pandemic. Before we get to our guests today, I wanna review a couple housekeeping details. The Greater Houston Partnership is a trusted source for information related to the COVID-19 pandemic. I'd like to highlight, oops, sorry about that. I'd like to highlight a couple things uh, resources as you consider how you might reopen safely. The partnership is providing guidance to ensure our companies and our organizations in the region can safely reopen, or as, as we say, work safe. Specifically, the partnership has developed 15 work safe 2.0 principles that provide guidance to companies and organizations as they develop the, their plans for reopening and or expanding their operations, while also protecting the health of their employees, the customers, and the public at large. We've also curated industry best practices and trade association guidance to help businesses develop sector specific uh, plans to minimize the risk of transmission of COVID-19 in the region and in the workplace. This guidance can be found on the partnership's updated WorkSafe page. At the conclusion of the webinar, we'll highlight where these materials can be found. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on Upskill Houston's YouTube channel. All attendees are muted for this webinar and your video is turned off for the entirety of the webinar. The chat function should, be, should not be used for Q&A. It can be used uh, to connect with our production team if you're having any technical issues. And if you do have questions for our guests or me, you should direct them to the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. The Q&A will be moderated and we'll get to your questions. Today, we're fortunate to have two leaders to address today's topic of designing virtual and micro internships. Catherine Taylor is the executive director of Genesis Works Houston, which supports high school students from challenged backgrounds to achieve college and career success through skills training and work experiences. And Jeffrey Moss is the founder and CEO of Parker Dewey, which focuses on addressing college to career transitions through what he calls micro internships. Both of our guests have distinguished careers in the private and nonprofit sectors and bring great insights into our topic today. So welcome, Catherine and Jeffrey. Thank you for being with us. In preparing for our conversation, it seemed to me that we wanted to cover several broad topics. First, in this pandemic, help our audience understand the changes, shifts, and changes and shifts you're seeing to see how we can support students achieve career success through work-based experiences. How are employers responding? How are students responding? So there's a, a couple of questions. And then Genesis Works and Parker do we prepare and connect students with employers in order to obtain valuable work ex experience? So we'd like to understand your approach and how you are adjusting as we confront the changing landscape in light of COVID-19. And then finally, you know, the audience would you know, probably appreciate understanding how can Houston respond and support work experiences in this uncertain time? And we'll go deeper into these topics. And for our audience during this discussion, we'll take time throughout to respond to the questions you submit via the Q&A function. So if you have questions, please feel free to submit them. And as our audience may know, we will probably not, probably not get to all of the questions, but follow up this webinar with an executive summary of the discussion. So let's get started. In January, I expect both you and both of you uh, had plans for work that was doing your good work and growing it. Help us understand how your model works and how you're adjusting it in light of COVID-19. Catherine, let's start with you at Genesis Works and how you approach providing work experiences for high school students during the school year in the summer. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Um, as you mentioned, we were prepared to train our largest cohort. Um, we had more students than we um, apply for the program and we were on our way to placing more interns um, and internships come fall. Um, so COVID-19 has had a pretty significant impact as we've had to pivot and go from an engaging in-person environment to virtual and remote. 
Um, so the way that our program typically works is we recruit and train from 34 high schools um, in the Houston area and students participate in an intensive eight week program over the summer um, as they're rising senior. So between their junior and senior year, we're really focused on professional skills or what many people know as soft skills, as well as technical skills that are needed um, across function, business and IT functions is our primary focus. But really the goal is to prepare students for the professional workplace so they can adapt quickly um, and provide meaningful work. Um, we know that soft skills are critical for career success and they help our students stand out. Um, we're a high feedback model, so we're looking for students that can come in um, and adapt, um, make the changes that they need, um, and show us that they're really workplace ready. Um, once they finish their summer training, they are placed in a year-long internship with one of our 50-plus corporate partners across um, Houston. They go to school in the morning and then they balance that with um, going to work five days a week for about 20 hours a week. Um, and we have a really low um, staff to student ratio. So for every 20 students we serve, we have a full-time staff member that not only helps the student navigate um, all that is new in the workplace and school, but also supports our corporate partners, um, helps them identify meaningful work that high school students can accomplish, but also helps them navigate the new world of work. Um, as you can imagine, with COVID-19, we, as I said, we've adapted quickly. Um, we're still providing students with college and career support um, as long as, as well as they're helping them with whatever they need to get past high school graduation. Um, but we're also serving students in remote internships and serving them virtually. So I'm pleased to say that um, we still have 121 um, interns working remotely. And thank you to many of our partners for adapting quickly um, and making that happen. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk a little bit later, but obviously technology is critical right now. So making sure students have access to technology, um, but also um, adapted to the new tools. So today we're on Zoom. Many of our students didn't use Zoom daily, but they have had to learn quite quickly. I can imagine. And Jeffrey, I understand. I know Parker Dewey has a very different or slightly different you know, approach to this. So could you explain kind of how you approach this uh, in terms of you know, providing work-based experiences? And I know it's primarily college students. Yeah, thank you, and, and honor to be here. Um, yeah, so Parker Dewey was founded about five years ago specifically to help provide pathways from college to career. And we sort of didn't know how this whole COVID situation was gonna shake out. We had the expectation that we would see a massive jump in the number of college students and recent grads who are engaged uh, or interested in working in micro internships, um, but we weren't quite sure what we would see on the corporate side. And I'm really happy to say we we're just looking at some numbers for May. We've seen a 50% increase uh, from May or from April to May. So month over month, a 50% increase in the number of micro internships being offered by companies. And as an aside, April was a record month. Um, so it's been really, really positive to see more and more companies and organizations offering micro internship opportunities to these career launchers. Um, from a definitional perspective, uh, probably should have started with this, micro internships, the way we define them, are short-term paid professional assignments that are similar to the types of projects or tasks that you would give a summer intern or a new hire if you had one around. So in marketing, it might be content creation or market research or social media calendars. In sales, it could be prospect research or competitive analyses in finance, in HR, in accounting, we've seen that every professional in every industry has these short-term assignments that we call the we shoulds and the I shouldn'ts. Things that you say, hey, we should really go update our job descriptions, but I don't have the time, or I shouldn't be spending my Saturday morning crunching this list. And while it may not be the highest and best use of time for you as a busy professional, for a college student, it provides a great way to demonstrate skills and learn about different industries and roles and build their network. And to Catherine's point, a really great way to showcase these soft skills, or as we call them, the core skills like communication, adaptability, problem solving, grit, et cetera. Um, so we're really seeing this whole micro internship model really taking off. 
both for companies that are trying to figure out how to respond to a remote environment, but also companies saying that this fall's recruiting process just ain't gonna take place on campus the way it once did. How are we gonna start planning, not just for our current recruiting needs, but our needs six, 12, 18 months from now? And I think as we were talking prior, you know, one way to think about the micro internship is it's like a five to 40 hour project that's pretty self-defined with a very specific result. Is that a fair way to, to talk about it? Perfect, perfect way of, of defining it. And one thing that's really, really important is when we define the model, we did not see it being a replacement for the 10 week onsite summer internship or a replacement for the full-time role, a replacement for post-secondary education. We saw it very much as a complement. Something, and, and one of the college students described it perfectly. He called it job dating. He said, I'm being forced to jump into the engagement of my 10-week internship and the marriage of my full-time role. I have no way to really date, no way to learn about different industries or roles, and no way for companies to learn about me. And that's especially important for students who come from underrepresented populations or first generation in college or are pursuing majors that don't sound like job titles. How can they really demonstrate and showcase these skills that to Catherine's point are most valued by the employers? And what we found was these short term projects become a great way of doing it, not as a replacement for anything else, but to create that pathway or funnel, if you will. And Catherine, I mean, this also probably ties into some of the work that you do, which is help people explore careers, but then support them as they, you know, may be there for the entire year. <clears throat> How do you approach that? And one question did show up, which is uh, Genesis Works interns are paid, correct? Absolutely, yeah. It is um, a paid internship, which um, is really critical for students coming from underserved communities. Many of them have to work. Um, and that's just a necessity. So a paid internship allows them to continue to work, but in a really meaningful environment um, that is really on a, helps them to find a career path. So I think where we're a little bit different, similar but also different from um, what Jeffrey mentioned is it is a year long internship. I think high school is a really critical time for a lot of individuals, specifically our students and it helps them understand what is possible. It introduces them to a professional workplace. It's possible that they've not had an opportunity to engage in you know, the downtown of Houston, um, but also they might be interested in accounting or IT, and their internship could confirm that that's, they love that and they wanna to continue to pursue that pathway, whether that college or some type of post-secondary, um, after high school, but it also could tell them, hey, you know, I thought I loved accounting, but honestly, this is not what I thought it was, and I'm not going to commit to a college pathway in accounting. So we see the magic of both sides, um, and I think that there's no better person to help a student um, make that determination than to really provide it an experience. So, you know, I think what Jeffrey does is wonderful, and it enhances um, the experience, the college experience. Um, for somebody who's already picked that pathway, but I think for us, it also helps inform if a student is um, on the right track. I'll, I'll be honest, in high school, um, I wanted to be a, a therapist. I actually really didn't know much about what therapists did. I just thought it was probably cool from what I saw on TV. So I think that we're, this can really help define a student's interests. And, and you're, hitting, you're hitting such an important point that in high school, we don't know what we wanna be. Do you know, it's probably true in college also. I mean, college freshmen, sophomores, juniors, even seniors, how do you know what you want to do? I, I talked about the fact recently in an interview that I did my summer internship between junior and senior year in public accounting because I was, I was an accounting and finance major. And I realized the first week I didn't want to be an accountant. Now, I went to all the info sessions. I had all the informational interviews and mentoring. It all sounded great. But when I actually got into the role, it's like this ain't for me. And I had to spend, first of all, nine more weeks there, and they were stuck with me for nine more weeks. But the second thing that was so important is I went back to school, and I had my offer from Cooper's, but I went back to school with one day the point of one thing I didn't think I wanted to do. I had no context by which I could compare it. And again, how do I know what is the right path? What we're trying to do, and, and again, it builds upon what Catherine says, is provide this opportunity for students to get a mosaic of different real professional experiences. That way, when they're jumping into, whether it's the two-month summer internship or the year-long apprenticeship or the full-time role, 
they're doing some with, they're doing so with at least some context and some exploration beforehand. And is it also safe to say, Jeffrey, that part of this also helps people see that, you know, let's take your example, accounting, you're going to go work for Coopers and Librand or Pricewaterhouse Coopers now. And I'm old. But it also, huh? I'm old. Cooper is. I, <laughs> but I mean, it opens up other ways to see where that role plays in because it could be internal to a business function. It could, you know, you could use it in multiple places. And I think this whole idea is a lot of folks get sidetracked to go like, it's only this place where I can do this role yeah. as opposed to being to ex exposed to Huge. these roles show up in multiple Huge issue. I mean, we had the conversation with one of the large investment banks where they talk about the fact that college students interested in fintech all want to go to the, to the West Coast. And they don't realize that this bank has more money invested in fintech internally than all of the Silicon Valley backed companies combined. But students don't realize it. You think you have to go again to the West Coast to do it. We're doing work with Pepsi. And Pepsi made this great comment that college students don't know their brand. And I was a little bit baffled because I'm like, everyone knows Pepsi. And like, yeah, you think about this as a soda company or you think about the snack food, but you don't necessarily think about a strategy role at Pepsi. But we're doing some really interesting strategy things. You don't have to go to McKinsey or Bain if you're interested in strategy. How can the companies get the, that exposure and build a brand with students as prospective employers, especially for those on the consumer brand side as well? No, I think that's helpful. And, you know, in this world, and I'm going to give, we had a data point today. We had some employers from the region sharing with the United Way Thrive Partners about what they're seeing. And this whole idea of the soft skills and the new digital and technical skills that are showing up. And to the point is no one has used Zoom until, you know, infrequently until now. And you know, the employers were saying, we want people who know how to use technology this way before they even get to the workplace, because they're going to have to show up, they're going to have to interview that way. And so in, in many respects, you know, are you adapting to this virtual world that also has its own skill building? I assume you are, Catherine. Is that yeah. fair? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, in honesty, all, my staff had to adapt quickly, right? So, you know, we use Zoom infrequently or for, we're used to doing conference calls, but I think what's interesting about this virtual world is many of the things that, whether you call them soft skills, professional skills, or core skills, um, are really critical, whether you're in person or virtual. So effective communication, um, it looked a little bit different, maybe in an in-person meeting, but it's actually more critical now. Um, how to follow up, um, you know, how do you show people that you're motivated and engaged when you're on Zoom seven hours a day? And I think for many of our students, um, you know, in the school setting, that looks very different than in the work setting. So I think for us going forward and navigating a virtual environment, we're gonna to continue to do a lot of what we're already doing, um, but there's additional things that we will be sharing with our students this summer. Um, and there are different tips and tricks of how to use Zoom, how to have an engaging meeting, um, you know, I think for the first couple of weeks, we all just jumped on Zoom and did what we did. And now we're figuring out how do you engage somebody if you're having a two hour strategy meeting? What does that look like when you don't have the backup of a whiteboard in a conference room? And our students, um, what's amazing is they're extremely resilient um, and they've grown up with technology. So oftentimes um, they're probably adapting quicker um, and understand the technology better than many of us. So. Um, I don't know that a lot of our program is changing, but we're having to learn how do you engage in a virtual environment. I think that's going to be critical for everyone's success. And just a reminder to, to the audience, please feel free to use the Q&A. And I see we have two questions there, but they're kind of into the next phase of kind of where I wanted to take this conversation, which really is around you know, this is about engaging multiple stakeholders to see the value proposition of providing these kinds of opportunities. You know, employers have to, you know, you've got to engage employers that are open to providing these opportunities. I know Jeffrey works closely with schools that, you know, see this as a value proposition to help students find pathways. And then how do you help students understand, here's a great opportunity, whether it's a Genesis Works internship or micro internship or other things. So let's talk about how you pitch the value proposition you know, from an employer's perspective and then those other stakeholders, because those are kind of, you know, how do we do that 
and engage and get folks thinking about it. Jeffrey, we'll start with you if that's all right. Because I know you've got a, sure. you've been thinking about how you make this a you know, valuable proposition for the employer. Yeah, um, it, it's important. And, and what I love about this space, um, and again, I'm going to focus on college to career, but I think it's certainly true with high school to career as well. Um, what I love about this space is it's one of the few areas in all of education where you have complete alignment of interest between the stakeholders. And part of the reason Parker Dewey's logo is the Venn diagram with the three circles is we view ourselves as trying to sit at that intersection. The best interests of the students, the colleges or universities, and the employers. And what's great is all three of those groups want to see students wind up not just employed in any job and not just graduating and not just filling a seat, but they want to see students employed in the right job upon graduation. And all three of those stakeholders are highly, highly motivated to make that happen, which is wonderful. So when we talk about engaging employers, part of what we've done is two things. First of all, we created a platform that was designed to be easy. And what I mean by that is back to my earlier comment that we all have these we should and I should in projects, we designed a platform to provide immediate support. So as a busy professional with too much on your plate, we're not asking you to spend an hour a week mentoring. It's great if you can do it and it's great if you have time, but there's a lot of professionals who don't. And we're not asking you to commit to having someone in your office for a month or a year, whatever period of time. Again, it's great if you can do it, but there's a lot of professionals who don't. What we're saying is we have a network of highly motivated college students who want to help you with these projects that probably ain't the highest and best use of your time. Are you willing to take that help? Who's going to say no to that? So we've reframed it for that busy professional, but we've also reframed it within companies for the campus recruiters where they're saying we go to a campus and we're all recruiting the same handful of students from the same majors in the same schools, how can we get a competitive advantage without breaking the bank? Because again, there's an arms race. The, the displays are getting fancier. The online marketing's getting fancier. What we've said to them is, well, through micro internships, you can build that competitive advantage. You can introduce your brand to students who may not have considered your company. You can access schools that you may not be able to visit because of the cost or because N of students is just too small. So from a company's perspective, we've tried to create that value proposition from both stakeholders, both sets of stakeholders. The same is true with the student. So first of all, students all get paid for micro internships, but what we've actually heard from the students is that's the least important part. They are most interested in getting their experience. They're most interested in dipping their toe in the water and getting these equitable pathways into companies that may not otherwise consider them or the opportunity to explore industries they weren't thinking about or build their networks. So there was a question in the, in the Q&A about convincing students we found students don't need the convincing. Students are excited for these opportunities. They're excited to work on the projects. They're excited to get these professional experiences. What they don't want to do is necessarily jump into a long-term commitment in an area they're not sure about. They also don't want to be treated unfairly. Again, there's issues with unpaid internships and different conversation. Uh, but they want, they, they want and value these experiences. And finally, the universities are completely on board as well. To my earlier comment, they want to see the students professionally employed, not just because of the ratings, not just because of the metrics, although those are all important, but more importantly, they recognize that when a student is graduating and takes the right role with the right company, that means the company is more likely to come to campus and recruit. That's more likely the company will make the school a focus school. And with that comes significant investment. Most likely will that mean higher levels of student satisfaction and down the road alumni giving. So they see all of these other reasons that are still altruistic that want the student to be in the right role. And what they're finding is through these emerging programs, even pre-COVID, they provided ways of engaging employers and alumni to create these opportunities. Catherine? Yeah, I mean, what's great is Jeffrey has many of the same, you know, stakeholders or partners that we have. Um, and I think he did a great job of talking about it. I mean, I think our students are highly motivated. And uh, for a high school student who's willing to give up six to eight weeks of their summer, which is unpaid, um, to show how motivated they are, by the time they get through that, we're really giving our partners 
um, a highly motivated but also a skilled kind of entry level worker if you want to compare it to that. And we hear from our partners time and time again that oftentimes our interns come in more professional and prepared than even a recent college graduate who has not had an internship or the professional skills training. Um, so I think it's our partners view it as a win-win. They see it as a way to have low, a low cost investment to get meaningful work done. Um, and they're able to give back. And I think the value to many of our partners to have a young and fresh person come to their staff is very energizing. So I think for each partner, there might be a different way for a reason for why they partner, but they typically get multiple benefit benefits. I think to Jeffrey's point, um, all of our partners are talking about the lack of skilled talent that's available to them. Um, and we have that talent right here in our own backyard. We just need to do a better job of connecting students to opportunities, helping them understand why it's so important to gain that professional network, but then also encourage our partners to be willing to make that investment now that will help grow this diverse talent that we're looking for. I think Jeffrey's point, when I talk to a lot of recruiters um, from our partners, they talk about the lack of diverse talent that's out there and oftentimes it's because they're going to the same colleges and they're it's a lot of time and it is is costly to get to secure that talent so one of our you know selling points or what many of our partners have said is that we there's a great return on investment if they commit to genesis works in turn for our partners who've been working for us four plus years Many of them have full-time employees that have come from their high school intern um, or interns that have participated in Genesis Works for another client who find their way back to our network. So, you know, I think that sometimes the barrier of a high school student, there's so many reasons you could say why you wouldn't take um, a high school intern, but I think the value when our partners take the time to invest and make it work, um, you know, is, is a high return for them. Um, and I think the give back, right? So right now, as busy as people are, people are seeking connection um, to the community. Um, I think COVID has really exposed, um, you know, the digital divide and so many other um, issues that existed in our communities. And that's very obvious right now. So I think for us, it's really talking about that and how our partners are already part of the solution and in, in hoping that new companies um, will opt to participate in this way going forward. I'm going to combine a couple kind of issues that showed up in some of the questions. One is really this notion of, and I think, you know, both of you are providing real world experiences. And so how do we help people understand the value of that? But then there's also, in some respects, you know, how do, what barriers or issues do you run into if the educational institution needs to have it aligned to some sort of academic pathway, which is very different than how do we ensure folks get a good professional experience? I mean, do you have an issue? Are educational institutions raising that issue? Sorry, Peter, I missed the end. Um, the question is really about how do we align with education? The academic, yeah, kind of academic pathways and whether that's an issue. I think, you know, there are many cases where folks are going like, well, you can only do the internship if it fulfills kind of academic requirements. Yeah, um, so we definitely, uh, you know, we work with over 34 high schools. So I, I think it's really important to all of our school districts that we provide internships that align with pathways that students are learning, whether that's business or IT. Um, so we're very aware of that. Um, I think because we do really business technology that spans so many different types of career options that students have. Um, but I think what because of the timing of our internships, we can also help students better align their interests with what they decide to pursue in college or whether that's a direct to hire opportunity after high school. Um, so I'd say that's something that's talked about all the time, Peter. It's um, top of mind for us and for our schools. Um, and I think we all probably need to do a better job of making sure what students are learning you know, in the school environment aligns also to what's necessary from our partners. So, you know, oftentimes we really focus on here are the professional skills, what can our employers also help teach students um, as well, but really how do we become better partners and link, you know, what is that college experience and professional experience as well as digging deeper and um, even at the high school level is so critical. And Jeffrey, I mean, when you think about kind of 
the fact that these are real world projects, how do you help the students articulate, here's my, here's my real world experience because you know, the company's not going to provide this micro internship if it doesn't help them solve or address a specific issue. Yeah, there, there's a few parts to that question. And again, love, I, I love hearing from Catherine and Genesis works because so much of these things complement one another. And, and that's what's great about so many of these initiatives. None of them are mutually exclusive and they all, they all sort of reinforce, which is again, just wonderful. Um, one of the things that we do is we help the students understand those crosswalks from the classroom to the career. So for instance, if I'm a student pursuing a major that doesn't sound like a job title, philosophy, history, English, how do I understand that the skills I'm honing are actually valued to an employer? Things like research and the ability to communicate effectively or craft an argument or analytical thinking. And a lot of what we try to do is help the students understand those crosswalks. That if I am a philosophy student, I may not be comfortable applying for a marketing strategy full-time role, especially when it says marketing majors apply only. But if I'm going on and I see a micro internship as a competitive analysis, yeah, I can do that. I know how to research. I know how to analyze different competitors and craft an argument. I learned that in philosophy and I'm not being asked to commit to a full-time role there. I can sort of dip my toe in. Great. And what we're finding is these actual experiences actually wind up protecting post-secondary education. And in particular, the traditional liberal arts post-secondary education, because we're helping the students see, again, those crosswalks from those core classes to the real world, but we're also helping them demonstrate them or showcase them to an employer. That the employer that, again, I'm looking for a full-time hire in a marketing role, I was only thinking about marketing majors, but gosh, I see a student who may be a philosophy major, but he or she's worked on all of these interesting marketing strategy pro projects, analyzing the flavored water space or, or creating a social media strategy or, or uh, conducting an analytics review of, of SEO. Those are real actionable uh, artifacts that the student can demonstrate his or her skills that don't replace what they're learning in the classroom, but very much complement. The other thing we're seeing, which is really interesting, is we're bringing experiential learning into the classroom without taking away academic freedom. That I, as a student, back when I was a, a, a finance and accounting major, I might be doing a debt covenant analysis as a micro internship on behalf of a company. I can go to my professor's office hours to ask for insights or input or how am I, am I computing the cost of capital the right way? That's a hell of a lot more interesting to that professor than the student who fell asleep in class. And for me, now I'm starting to tie what I learned in his or her class to the real world. And what we're also seeing is these professors are then bringing it into the classroom. Again, without taking away academic freedom, we're not telling the professor to start teaching to what employers want, but the professor, when, is, when he or she's talking about how to set a discounted cash flow, will say, hey, Jeff, why don't you tell the class about this project you're working on that we're discussing in office hours and how you came up with the right cost to cap? All of a sudden, you're bringing experiential learning again into the classroom without forcing um, sort of the change, if you will. Yeah, Jeffrey, I, you said, articulated that so well. I, you know, the thing that's always interesting is the students' reflection at the end of the year of their internship. So I think we read these and believe that accounting looks just like this, or there's one type of engineering role that exists. And I think the aha moment that our students have and that I think really the power that our um, professionals can give our students is to color in the details that they don't see um, and connect those points and to understand, you know, what does a business intern mean? Well, a student can go work in a marketing department, an HR department, and to be honest, they don't even know that those departments typically exist. We just see the marketing that the company produces, right? And so, Jeffrey, I couldn't say that better than how you um, shared that, but I think that's for, for the business community, I think we often forget how high school felt to us or our, co our college classes, but I really feel like the, our business professionals fill in, fill in the lines that our students don't see, and that's really critical for people to have to prepare themselves for successful careers and to be informed about how they're going to invest their money in school. Yeah, and, and you're hitting on another really important point is the data also shows better academic outcomes. 
So when a student understands and appreciates how the classroom learnings translate, they tend to perform better in those classes and, and tend to stay at school and actually graduate versus dropping out, which as we know is a huge issue right now. With so much focus on accessibility, we're now having a completion issue at so many colleges and universities that's only been amplified by the current situation. So, I mean, just to kind of round this out, each of you helps your students kind of document the competencies and skills based upon what they've done so that they've got their record to move forward on and can use it effectively, correct? Mm -hmm. So you, in essence, help them think about their next, you know, what should be in their resume going forward. Completely, completely agree. I mean, that's, that's a lot of what we do is when a student finishes his or her first micro internship, uh, they get an offboarding document. I, I wish I'd come up with a better term, but it basically says, here's some things you should be doing. Here's, uh, you should be updating your resume and LinkedIn, and here's ways to think about what you did and how to convey it effectively to a prospective recruiter. Um, but more importantly, to take the time and reflect. What did you like about it? What didn't you like about it? How do you separate the role from the company? Um, because you may have liked a whole bunch of things about the role, but for whatever reason you learned you don't wanna work at a really big company, you prefer a smaller one. And, and not just to look at the single micro internship in a vacuum, but we talk about the fact the best case is for a student not to do a single micro internship from Microsoft and get hired, even though that happens. The best case is a student does five, 10, 20 of these throughout their entire academic journey. And that way they can start to hone in on what they really like and what the right fit is. And again, have that context to make the decision. And with 55% of recent college grads leaving their first job within the first year, the cost of a student making a bad decision is real. I mean, it's $30 billion a year is what it costs companies when these, call it career launchers, leave. And that's not my number. That's, that's sort of a public number. And that's after spending anywhere from 15 to $30 billion to hire them in the first place. Yeah, I, I think that as far as the multiple internships, you know, a lot of people don't complete an internship in high school. So we know that sets our students apart, but it oftentimes opens up the their understanding of how critical it is to have continued opportunities for internships and i'd say most of our students either intern again with us while they're in college or after high school but also find other opportunities like ones through parker dewey so i think that's you know i think somebody in one of the comments said well why do students not understand how important or valuable internships are i think if you've never had a professional job or an internship it's hard to know what value that brings um, and you often at times don't even recognize it until you start to build that network and you recognize kind of that social capital that you build. So, you know, it's one of those things is like you open one door and so many more doors open and each time you have that experience, you start to refine what you like about it. And sometimes it says, it comes down to the company culture and what questions to ask to make sure that you're identifying a workplace that you're going to be su successful in long-term. So there have been a couple of questions related to kind of this issue related to the, the fact that we're looking at virtual, we're targeting populations where there's a potential for digital divide. And so as we think about it, you know, there's the hardware question, there's the broadband question, there's, you know, all, all of this gets wrapped in. And so, you know, how are you seeing companies thinking about how you support, you know, students that may or may not have access the same way, you know, in other spaces. And so this kind of digital divide issue is showing up in some of the questions and I kind of wanted to broaden it up and, you know, in the sense of it's both a hardware issue, it's a you know, knowledge issue and it's a broadband issue. Are you seeing any kind of support from the employers and colleges in that space? Yeah, for us, um, we typically don't have our clients loan out um, computers to our students because our student, I mean, the students are in the workplace. They typically work there. They don't take work home at the end of the day. Um, I think we were surprised at how generous our clients were to provide a computer to students. Um, and for those that that was not an option or they didn't feel comfortable, we were able to supply a computer for those students. Uh, I'll be honest, going into this next in the to the summer we're going to have to provide a lot more technology um, than obviously we anticipated um, and we're working with a few partners 
there are some local organizations, one being CompuDopt, um, who's been very generous um, giving out computers to students. We also know that many of our school districts have technology, so I think it's about partnership and figuring out who can come there to help and going to your partners and just making the ask. But I think, Peter, you started hitting on, it's not just about them having a computer, do they have access to internet? So many of our students would have gone to a Starbucks or another place where they could access um, internet and now having to realize how many of our families in our current communities don't have that access. Um, so we're really working through those problems one by one and doing a better job of assessing through surveys um, how students and what they need to be set up for success. So I expect that's going to be a continuous problem. It's definitely uncovered. Um, I think our school districts on a prior webinar, we found out um, they reported some data as, you know, 40% of students not having an internet or a form of technology to do virtual learning. So I know there's a lot of people that are working in partnership to solve this problem. Um, we feel that if we want this um, community of students to have access to internships, then we need to be part of solving that technology piece since we've typically been in an in-person um, program and we're adjusting and adapting quickly. Which also raises this broader question, which once again has a, a couple of folks have alluded to in, in the Q&A, which is how do we build, you know, this capacity of students to, to work virtually, but also, you know, how are companies, you know, complementing, supplementing with their own training and educational paths within the company that helps support the development of those skills as well. Jeff, and, Jeffrey, or go ahead, Jeffrey. Yeah, I was just going to say what we've learned, um, there are a lot of different systems that new employees are onboarded and learn how to use. Um, in many of our internships, we found that students had not been taught or given access. Um, so when we had to go to a remote or virtual environment, we realized that they didn't have work that they could do virtually. So I think looking through to this next year, you know, we're really focused on how do we work with our clients to identify what programs would allow virtual work and making sure that students are onboarded and have access to that from day one. Um, whether they start off virtual or not, we need to have capacity to be able to kind of turn on and off as needed. And I know we're a little bit different than what Jeffrey will share because I think they operate virtually from the beginning. Yeah, we've been we've been virtual since day one. Like 98, 99% of micro internships were remote, uh, and we found the short term nature of each project just made remote better for everyone. For companies, if I need help with sort of a, a quick project, I don't necessarily need or want to think about well. Is the student gonna gonna clear security or uh, not not clear security but I need to get a security badge or where he or she gonna sit within the office and by the way I'm only gonna be able to have an encatchment area tied to my local area or my local geography if it's if it's a real um, if it's non-site uh, project in the case of the remote micro internships all of a sudden you can provide these opportunities to students irrespective of where they are and you're sort of taking some of the hindrances off the student things like transportation that even for a Chicago-based company that is going to retain a Chicago-based student for a micro internship transportation is a real deal it's a real issue for that student who might be at school on the north side or on the south side who getting to an office for a five or ten hour project is a really big deal um, and something that again hinders diversity equity and inclusion within companies um, the other thing to the training side, what, we've, what we found is companies are willing to invest in training. They are willing to invest in onboarding. The issue's been, back to my earlier comment, that with 55% of new hires leaving, companies don't necessarily want to invest as much or as, mess, as much early on to the extent that there's this opportunity for the mutual test drive before you commit to the onboarding and training, all of a sudden companies are willing to make that investment especially if they're confident in an individual's softer core skills, like again, the communication, great problem solving, et cetera. So we don't have that transportation issue in Houston at all. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So I'm gonna throw a slight curveball because you know, the pandemic has you know, displaced a ton of workers. And I know a lot of your work is focused in the educational institution, so I'm, institutions. But how do we begin thinking about how we use these kinds of opportunities 
for folks that are going to have to do reskilling and upskilling and probably need at least similar, you know, this idea of a work experience to know, am I making the right choices and a good fit for me? I know this is kind of a curveball, but I mean, there is this notion of how are we going to help support, you know, millions and millions of people across this country who have been displaced and who may not be able to go yeah. back to their roles and they're going to yeah. need new skills, but they're going to need experience as well. We, we get this question all the time. Um, so we get this question on the reskilling the same way we get the question about the high school. And, and our short answer is, look, we stay in our lane. We are 100% focused on college to career, not because we don't think those other two things are important, but we think there's better organizations that are better prepared, like, like Catherine's. Like, perfect example. What we are doing with um, those organizations that do want to support, whether it's reskilling or high, skilling, high, high schools or what, whatnot, is we're sharing all of our learnings. So to the extent... Um, to use your example, Peter, to the extent a group focus on reskilling or retraining those displaced who might have more experience, we make all of our micro internships available. We'll give them complete access to the library in case they want to, quote unquote, teach some of these projects in the classroom environment or virtual classroom environment so those individuals can learn. But we don't want to get in the way of that because we're not a training organization. That was not our core competency. The same way for the high school students or programs that want high school students to gain these professional experiences, we'll give them access. We'll say, oh, you wanna, you wanna teach marketing in the classroom? Here's four marketing micro internships that are the most common ones. Feel free to teach them. And by the way, we're happy to try to bring employers to the table to guest lecture or be involved or whatnot, but we don't want to get in the way of any of those other organizations, but, but it is a huge need, and I'm curious to see the way it all shakes out. So it sounds like what you're suggesting is the micro-internships, the way you've documented them, are case studies that could be used in a classroom. Exactly, exactly, okay. because we know, we know they are in demand by companies. And, and one of the things, and again, we, we sort of touched on this before, there's a lot of discussion around the skill shortage or, or the skills gap. Uh, my personal opinion is, for the most part, there is no skills gap. We can talk very, very technical areas in healthcare, technical areas tied to manufacturing floors. Uh, we have to work with very specialized machinery. Without, like, with those exceptions noted, there is no skills gap. When you look at the skills that employers most demand, back to Catherine's point, they are core skills. When you look at employers' complaints for why they made a bad hire, it's not because someone doesn't know Excel or can't use a CRM tool. It's because they don't have the grit or they don't have the communication skills or the problem solving. We don't have a skills gap. We have a matching problem. And all we're trying to do is solve that matching problem between the college students and the companies, because we think that the resume or the academic transcript or academic pedigree is not a good signal for who is the right fit at that early career phase. When you start getting into the retraining and reskilling, again, to your point, we're happy to share those case studies for how an individual can hone and demonstrate those core skills, especially if they're being retrained, but it's very different than the core of what we're trying to do. Sorry yeah. for the ramble. No, okay. I, Jeffrey. Okay. I think what you talked about is, you know, there are some specific jobs that require specific skills and train, but it all comes with training. And I think the matching is challenging. And I think we see that every day working with our CTE directors um, at the high school level, but also listening to corporate partners. Um, we have students who are, you know, being trained in certain areas, but are lacking the professional skills. So they can't get past the interview process yeah. or they don't know how to navigate their hurdles and steps. I mean, now we apply online. You don't really pick up the phone and talk to a person. So if they don't have the past experience that, you know, is filtered out in that interview process, they never make it to that initial first step. So, you know, I think where Genesis Works can really come in and be a bigger part of the solution is what we're good at is recruiting students for the opportunities that they're interested in. And we're good at finding partners that want those students and connecting those two. And so, as Jeffrey said, most of our partners are willing to do the training. Believe and admit, if you came from company A, we're going to retrain you and how we do it. Um, but bring us somebody who's motivated, who can collaborate, who can communicate effectively and is going to show up day after day. And I think that we have to do a, a better job of creating channels that at least here, our high school students are expressing interest in and showing them what job opportunities actually exist. 
Um, and if we do that right, I think that we're going to fill a lot of the roles that people are currently struggling to fill. Um, and so I think when you talk about what emerging gaps are going to exist kind of when we come back out of COVID, um, some are going to be the same and some are going to be new. But helping our students understand where those opportunities are, it's about exposure and the opportunity to get their foot in the door. Um, and that's where we can help. So we're getting close to kind of winding this down and there's some really good questions in there. One really good question is, are there state or federal incentives for internships that would be, you know, be, would be helpful in getting employers to invest in students? You know, and that, you know, obviously has many different pieces of it. And then I'll kind of ask kind of a wrap up Yeah, I mean, for us, there, um, there's quite a bit of federal funding that's available, federal and state funding available. Um, most of it is focused on what would be called opportunity youth or students that are no, they're not high school students necessarily. So for our current program, um, we don't really have access to help support um, with any type of government funding for our high school program. Um, but once we get into the space of talking about apprenticeship programs or programs that offer more direct to hire, there's a lot of funding for those opportunities. Um, and what it really takes is an employer being willing to invest in kind of a cohort of young people um, and then finding the young people that are interested in that pathway. Um, so we're currently exploring how do we take what we do best kind of on our high school side and implement that into some other areas. Um, and I think that's, you know, what, why upskill is so important to me um, is really linking to the partners that have these needs um, and really working. They already have the infrastructure. They already know how to onboard and they already know how to train. Um, but we can help organize what that recruitment process is. And yes, there's a lot of funding for it. It just takes um, time and patience to navigate it and make it work. And it's probably not structured in a way that really helps. And I think you know, the value proposition, I think from Jeffrey's point of view is you're getting value and you should pay for it mm -hmm. as a company. And yeah. therefore not, if we're looking at these micro internships. Yeah, and we specifically built the model so it wouldn't require federal or philanthropic funding. Um, and, and that was part of our goal. Now, what's been interesting is we just saw an, an initiative in another city, and, and Peter, I think you and I may have talked about it offline, uh, but we just saw an initiative in another city where there is a grant um, to provide students with professional opportunities. And what they're doing is they're essentially subsidizing micro internships on behalf of small for-profit technology companies that they believe will be the next emerging uh, group of big companies coming out of the city. So these small companies that have been impacted by COVID that may not have the money or the capital to pay for interns or new employees because fundraising dried up or venture funding dried up or whatever, but they're still viable businesses. Well, there are, um, again, this, this foundation is now subsidizing that. So they are the ones paying the student to work on these projects on behalf of the small companies. That's some pretty interesting initiative. There's another one going on where one of the big financial services organizations is funding something similar, where they said, we already have our intern class for the coming summer. We don't have these projects. Now we can debate whether or not they do or don't. It's a different conversation. But what they said is we want to commit 50 grand to providing opportunities for college students to work on behalf of these, again, these emerging technology companies. And we're doing it partially because we want to support the community and provide these opportunities to the students, but we also think these technology companies could be our next set of clients. So we want to use this to start to build those relationships, which I think is a really, really smart strategy. And what's great about it is everyone wins. Everyone benefits. There's no, it's not a zero sum game where someone is doing it at the expense of someone else. So well, that's helpful. And so as we close out and you know, just really briefly, you know, as we think about kind of what's coming and how life has changed, what advice would you give kind of upskill Houston and Houston as we think about how do we help develop these skills and provide these opportunities, whether they're full on internships or the micro internships? Because I think what we have is now a nice spectrum of opportunity that we should Yeah, um, I mean, I think 
where Upscale has is you already have a lot of the partners that are discussing the same issues. So whether you're on the school side, the community side, or um, the job side, the partner side, the corporate partner side, we all know that we're trying to solve the same problem. Um, and so I think, you know, Peter, what you guys can do is really help make the connection. So, you know, Genesis Works has existed for a long time here in Houston, but there's many companies that um, probably don't even know who we are or what we do. Um, and so really having an organization that helps connect problem solvers together um, is, you know, priceless really. So I think that's, we're here to support. We wanna serve more students. Um, I'll be honest, it takes money to make that happen. Um, whether that's federal funding or, you know, philanthropic support by individual donors, um, it costs money to recruit and train students. That's, but I think what we can do is um, help support and make that process easier for our schools and for our clients. So um, I just continue to encourage you to make those connections um, so that we're not searching around and wasting time um, because we know that the, these issues existed before COVID-19 and they're going to be here when we get past this. Okay. Yeah. I see you're responding to a question, Jackie. <laughs> That, that was impressive. I guess my hand's too close. That's the problem with having the <laughs> no, camera no, no, down here no, no, no. at the bottom of the screen. Um, I'll wait to respond. Um, I, I would say there's two things I would suggest. First of all, to build upon what Catherine said, don't look for a silver bullet. There is, there is not one single solution. The needs for someone being who, who's been, been pushed out of the workforce and need to be retrained is materially different than the needs of a high school student materially different than the needs of a career launcher who's graduating college. Three very, very different groups, and there might be some similarities and some things that you can learn across all of those, but they are three very different approaches. Um, so don't look for the silver bullet. The second thing that ties to that is don't make the perfect the enemy of the good. Um, again, it's a trite saying, but I think it's really true. Companies say, okay, we need to hire better. Let's, or we need to drive diversity. Let's go throw a whole bunch of money at this single program. And met, like, you're not going to solve it again with a single solution and you're not going to solve it in a way that's perfect. Find ways to chalk up little wins. I know one of the topics we didn't get to as much as I think we'd all hope to is diversity and inclusion that we see so many DEI efforts fall through because again, they wind up being check the box. How do you actually focus on retraining hiring managers to look beyond sort of uh, one's background or socioeconomic or demographic? How do you retrain them? That's not something you can do overnight. So don't try. Instead, find those little wins that you can chalk up that ultimately bring someone there. And I think those are great areas for upskill to, to step up and, and create that value for all of these individuals within Houston, but also the companies and the other stakeholders. And Peter, if I can add one more thing, I think to keep the business community thinking about long-term solutions as we're all, you know, reacting to what's going on right now and thinking short-term companies are experiencing layoffs and they're making other cost reductions. And I think really a, a future focused lens of what do we need to still be doing now because when we look up five years from now these problems are going to be here and I think it's really easy for us to get caught up in the day-to-day -day stress um, and not think about continuing this important work. So Catherine, Jeffrey, thank you so much. This has been exciting and interesting and has been you know, helpful. You know, as the audience will see, we've posted um, your web connections and websites to the you know, so that they have that. Um, I want to thank our audience. You know, a lot of this discussion is focused on the professional and soft skills. If you recall, in our last virtual forum, we shared kind of the work that we've done with Red and Black to create these uh, animated videos as part of upskillmylife.org and focused on soft skills. So, you know, once again, highlight that. Thank you for participating in today's Upskill Works Forum. As you'll see, you know, we're looking at other ones and we haven't set specific dates, but we're gonna be firm, as we firm those up, we'll get those out to you. And as always, we're open to suggestions. So feel free to email, uh, tweet, whatever you want toward us. And we will work on getting, you know, additional, you know, forums and series that make sense for you. So thank you for taking the time today. We appreciate uh, your support and your interest in upskill, in upskill work. Thank you.
Thank you. Okay.